Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, Mr. Clarence Anthony. All right. Oh, you can play that a little bit more. We behind anyway, so go ahead and play it a little bit more. You know, but I, I, I do think um, as, as we were thinking about how do we start back up again, I did want to reflect on that song because it is about what's going on in our nation right now. And Marvin Gaye, when he wrote that, probably didn't recognize that it was going to be some, a song and words that would probably be with us for the rest of our lives. Because we got to ask that question, what's going on? The thing is, we also have to come up with solutions uh, to that question. And this whole um, conference that Mayor Hancock uh, put together with Mayor Lightfoot, Mayor Turner, and others on that Saturday morning call, on, the, uh, on that Zoom call uh, with Representative Bacon and others, um, this came alive. So I'm, I'm so proud of uh, what we've been able to do here. You know, I was also reflecting on that, um, on our panel that we had and um, the fact that it is very difficult to be elected official and mayor uh, in this day and time, and that's why we're working with the mayors here to be able to go back home. But I was trying to find this quote and I'd say, who said this? And it was President uh, Lyndon B. Johnson. When the burdens of the presidency seem unusually heavy, I always remind myself it could be worse. I could be a mayor. <laughs> but that tells the story. That tells the story that even President of the United States recognize how important, but also how challenging uh, the role is. Now, you talk about a challenging role. I want to uh, introduce this great American uh, in our nation nearly 250 years, our first black American to serve as U.S. Attorney General, A.G. Holder, Eric Holder, has a greeting. Good afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity to address this group of distinguished public servants, dedicated civic leaders, and good friends. Thank you to Mayor Hancock and Mayor Lightfoot for convening this conversation, and thank you to everyone here for your commitment to the most essential tenet of our democracy, the right to vote. You know, for as long as America has existed, two opposing forces have, have fought over how we express and confer the rights and privileges of citizenship, freedom, and equality. Those who believe in a more inclusive nation have been countered by those who seek to maintain their own power. And today, today, we're in the midst of an attack on the franchise not seen since the Jim Crow era. It's a multi-pronged assault that seeks to roll back protections for voters, restrict access to our democracy, and redefine the way that power is gained and exercised in the United States. We have seen this assault in voting restrictions, voter ID laws, and voter roll purges that have unfairly, and in some cases illegally stripped Americans of their rights. We have seen it in gerrymandering and map manipulation that has allowed politicians, politicians to pick their voters so that individuals with radical views and minority support can illegitimately govern with majority power. We have seen it in a Supreme Court that has issued decisions that abdicated the court's own responsibility to achieve justice in the face of partisan gerrymandering. And we have seen it in Congress where, where just days ago, a fraction of the government with a minority of the vote continued to block legislation that would protect a right guaranteed to every eligible citizen. The perpetrators of this assault would, will tell you that they are they're protecting voter integrity or fighting back against some non-existent voter fraud. But their actions haven't made our elections safer or more secure. They haven't improved the quality or the accessibility of our politics. 
Instead, they have stripped Americans of the fundamental privileges to which they are entitled and undermined the core promise of American democracy. And that's why this conversation is so very important and why action is critical, especially at the state and local level. We need to repair the damage that is being done to our democracy. We need to create lasting, durable safeguards that protect our most essential freedoms. We need to codify expansive voting rights into law so that every eligible American can cast their ballot and be confident that it will be counted. We need to ban partisan and racial gerrymandering so that all people, including people of color, can be represented by their public servants and can hold their politicians accountable. We need to ensure that this country lives up to its fundamental promise and its highest ideals. That's what we're all talking about here. Through your conversations, you'll, you'll seek answers to questions about who we are and who we aim to be as a nation and as a people. You'll explore the, the road ahead and chart a path forward that seeks to lift us up and hold us to our most solemn vows of fairness, inclusivity, and justice. Your work, your work will determine not just what kind of democracy we'll be, but whether we will be a democracy at all. Not only what kind of future we will have, but whether there will be a future for all of us. Now, there's no doubt that we're facing a, a difficult challenge. The path of right in this country has never, has never ever been smooth, but we have seen over and over again how the power of a disciplined and determined people can reshape this nation for good. We have seen what activists and public servants can do when we stand together, when we work together, when we speak up, when we speak out to move forward together. We have seen time and time again how the, the marching feet and strong will of this country's citizens can bend that long arc of the moral universe towards justice. Now, the job before us will not be easy, but this country, this idea is worth fighting for. And if we fight together, arm in arm, side by side, then I have no doubt that we can achieve the stronger democracy, the better country, and the more just society that all Americans deserve. All of you who are here today are on, on the front lines of this fight, and I couldn't ask for better allies, colleagues, and friends in our shared effort. So I wanna thank you all again for everything that you have done in the service of that mission. Thank you for your participation and for being a part of this work. I wish you a productive conversation today, and I look forward to all that you will achieve together in the days, months, and years ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney General uh, Holder, uh, for those greetings. And now um, we're gonna have a, an amazing panel that really talks about framing uh, of the legal issues related to voting rights uh, in America. And it's gonna be moderated by our own um, AG of the city of Denver. I may be talking in future, you never know. <laughs> um, Denver City Attorney Kristen Brunson. Take it away, Kristen. Thank you, Mr. Anthony. All right, well, good afternoon, folks. I hope you're enjoying your lunches. I'm e extremely honored uh, to be welcoming uh, our esteemed panelists. And so if uh, Ryan and Ron, if you guys would come up, I'm gonna do an introduction of both of them as they join me at the stage. Uh, our third panelist had a, had a health issue come up and was not able to join us today, but I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to have uh, our two speakers. So I'm gonna do an introduction, because while uh, I think sometimes mayors are well known to this group, uh, I wanna make sure that you all understand uh, the subject matter experts we've got up here today. So let me start with Ryan Haygood. Uh, Ryan is a nationally respected civil rights lawyer. He is currently president and CEO of the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice which he leads, uh, where he leads a majority of people of color staff in racial justice advocates who do cutting edge work. Um, he, under Ryan's leadership, the Institute's advocacy has led to the historic restoration of the vote to 83,000 people on parole and probation, a right that New Jersey had previously denied since 1844. 
Uh, he has also championed automatic and online voter registration, ending prison-based gerrymandering for state legislative redistricting and other advancements. And prior to joining uh, the Institute, Ryan serves as Deputy Director for Litigation at the NAACP, and many of you may have known of him in that role uh, because he litigated some of the most important civil rights cases of our time. In uh, two of those cases, he defended a core provision of the Voting Rights Act that is, of course, as we've heard throughout this conference, widely regarded as one of the greatest pieces of civil rights uh, legislation. Uh, and he did that before the United States Supreme Court. Also, and sitting next to uh, Ryan, is Representative Ron Reynolds. And Representative Reynolds was uh, sworn in on January 10th, 2011, as a state representative for House District 27. Uh, he is currently serving his sixth term in the Texas House. He is the first African-American state representative in Fort Bend County since Reconstruction. He was voted by his House colleagues as Freshman Legislator of the Year and Public Servant of the Year by the Houston Minority Contractors Association. He served as the House Minority Whip during the 83rd and 84th legislative sessions. He currently is the Vice Chair of the Texas Legislative Black Caucus. He also serves as a legislative leader for the Texas State NAACP and the Texas Coalition of Black Democrats. Uh, he has been deeply involved in fighting back voter suppression efforts in Texas, as you heard Mayor Turner talk about this morning. Um, and so we are very proud to have both of these speakers here today. So please help me welcome them both. So I'll start with uh, the panelists. You know, we've heard a lot of, of, of talk, of course, today about how voting rights are fundamental, that they are the bedrock of our democracy, and yet such disparity exists across the country. Uh, and it seems that if you live in Maryland or Colorado or Texas for that matter, uh, voters should be able to count on basic voting procedures uh, that are universal across the country. And so could you all each, I'd love for you to start by speaking to kind of the importance of what Vice President Harris said this morning in her video uh, where she called for a national baseline to voting. Let's start maybe with you, Ryan. Sure. Uh, so thankful to be here with you all uh, during such an important moment in history and to have this, this critical conversation. I just want to acknowledge the leadership of this mighty city and Michael Hancock. He and I, it turns out, we have a long history together. Uh, we went to the same high school. Uh, 20 or 30 years apart, he was there 20 or 30 years ahead, ahead of me. Um, but that high school is important to, to acknowledge. It's called Manuel High School. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a blessing to have been a part of that legacy. Uh, many folks have asked me since, since I've been back, so are there black folks in Denver? <laughs> Answer is yes. If you just would put in your Waze app 2600 Welton, eight tenths of a mile away, you'll be in the heart of Denver's black community, and there you'll find Manuel High School. So I just want to acknowledge the mayor's leadership to have a conversation about voting and democracy and power in, in this moment. And so to the important question asked, I think absolutely there's a need for federal legislation like that found in the Freedom to Vote Act that would standardize um, how voters experience democracy in their respective states. And the reason they don't is because of the leadership in those states. But I think it also reflects a broader theme that the Attorney General spoke about in his remarks about how democracy I think particularly for black people in this country, it's always, always, always been a contested exercise, right? Characterized by periods of broad expansion, almost always followed by efforts to scale back democracy. So really quickly, I just I see one of my dear friends here, uh, Mayor Reed of the great city of Montgomery, Alabama. He and I spent a lot of years working together to expand democracy in Alabama, which was the place, as we all know, that was the gift, the gift Alabama gave us. Yes was in the Voting Rights Act. One other gift that Alabama gave us was in tearing the heart out of the Voting Rights Act, and we'll talk more about that. But absolutely, yes, to standard, standardizing voting across the country, but also recognizing that there's this contested history of democracy by design. And so that's why I love this moment, because for us, 
thoughtful people in this room, we're recognizing we've seen expansion. Barack Obama, right? Right after his election, assault on the Voting Rights Act, Shelby County tears the heart out of the Voting Rights Act, then voter suppression. Then November 2016, right? Then January, 1, January 6, 2021, then expansion in 2020 elections, and then voter suppression again. And we're in this moment where we're seeking to expand democracy even as folks seek to scale it back. Wow, it's hard to add much more to that, but let me also uh, give greetings to Mayor Hancock and all of the distinguished guests, all of the corporate sponsors, everyone who made this conversation possible. This is the conversation mm -hmm. of the country. I know there's a lot of debate about the infrastructure bill right now, and that's so important, mm -hmm. but voting is the infrastructure of this country. Mm -hmm. It is the bedrock of this country. Uh, so goes voting, so goes the democracy, so goes what America stands for. You know what makes America so great and the envy of some other countries is the fact that we have a democracy because countries that are ruled by dictators, they don't have this pleasure and this privilege. But we should embrace that. We should not be going backwards. We should be embracing the fact that we have come so far as a country where we passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that made it possible for people like me to serve as state representatives because prior to that, we know we had barriers. Mm -hmm. We had Jim Crow laws. We had uh, all kind of things to put barriers in place. At, at one point in time, women couldn't vote. Blacks and Hispanics couldn't vote. Only white men with property could vote. They had grandfather clauses because there were literacy tests and there were so many barriers, poll taxes. And so it is shameful that in 2021, in 2021, when arguably some people would like to say that we live in a post-racial America, which we don't, uh, but, but we're still a country that sends our military abroad to, to protect our great democracy. And it's shameful that we have these voter suppression laws popping up all over this country that, that really make people wonder, uh, do they really count? Because the fact is that with these barriers, there are many people of color, many disabled people that will be disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. And voting, the reason why it's so important is because people's vote is their voice. Mm -hmm. Their vote is their voice. You, when you sit as a mayor you have, or a city council member, you have a duty and a responsibility to, for, for all kind of city services to make sure that the community is safe with the police that you hire and the fire and public services, people's trash are picked up and, and things like that. As state representatives, we, we enact laws that impact people. We set the budgets and we decide what kind of curriculum people have to have to graduate. At the federal level, you know what's going on in Congress. So ordinary people, the millions of Americans, when they cast their vote, they're casting their voice for how those issues are going to be decided. That is why it's so critical that we protect the fundamental precious right to vote. Thanks for that. Um, you know, I want to. Um acknowledge that a lot of the voter suppression efforts that we're seeing across the country right now really came uh, in the wake of these critical Supreme Court decisions. And so uh, I'd like to hone in for just a minute on uh, some of what you had talked about before. Uh, many of you uh, may not know uh, that uh, Mr. Haygood had an opportunity to be on the legal team uh, that argued the Shelby v. Holder case. And we're very lucky to have him here uh, and his perspective on that. Uh, and that was, I think, when you were with the NWACP Legal Defense Fund, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so can you, Ryan, would you give us a, uh, your perspective today on what uh, the Shelby case uh, really means for voters today? And certainly we've seen cases after that, whether it's the most recent Supreme Court case with, uh, you know, involving Arizona and sure. suppression efforts there. Sure. So, I, you know, I think that I, lo I love the question. Um, one of the things I find gratifying is that when you say Shelby County, Alabama, people have a sense now that that was a, a voting rights case, it was an important case, but the truth is, as Mayor Reed will tell you, right after we lost that case in 2013, it wasn't widely known. And what was lost in that case was a provision of the Federal Voting Rights Act. So the Federal Voting Rights Act, as you all know, was passed in response to a number of things, uh, namely the march over the Edmund Pettus Bridge, 
uh, that, uh, that connects the city of Selma to the city of Montgomery, and the violence that nonviolent peaceful protesters encountered there on, on the part of Alabama state troopers that was televised to the country on that evening of what was called Bloody Sunday. And within just nine months of that, of that Bloody Sunday march, President Lyndon Baines Johnson signed the Federal Voting Rights Act, which transformed this country. And it made it possible within just one generation of its passage for this country to elect its first black president and more than 12,000 black elected officials. It was really a transformative right. moment in the democracy of this, of this country, but it's important to know, consistent with our theme of challenging democracy and then seeking to expand democracy, the Supreme Court is not immune to that theme. The Supreme Court is very much influenced by, by the country and in fact is animated by sort of that theme to be sure. And so there have always been and had been challenges to the Voting Rights Act from the time it was first passed in 1965 including, most recently, a challenge that came from Shelby County, Alabama. As I mentioned, and as you all know, Alabama's gift to this country was the Voting Rights Act, and unfortunately, it was also the, the state that had the county that to help to bring it down. So there was a, a direct challenge to Section 5's constitutionality. Section 5, at that time, applied to all or part of 15 jurisdictions, including parts of New York, where, where I am, in Arizona, and mostly the American South, and it required those jurisdictions if they wanted to enact any voting change to seek federal approval. On the theory, they had very long and demonstrated histories of racial discrimination in voting, right? And so in that way, Section 5 was like a, was like a shield. It protected voters from bad acts on the part of elected officials and, and other officials. And so the Supreme Court, in a really fascinating decision, and I use that descriptive word charitably, <laughs> said, listen, the country has moved. Mayor Reed, the country has elected a black president. Surely you don't now still need Section 5's protections because look, this was the chief argument that Alabama made. What's interesting though, is that the way President Obama won the election, as you all know, is he received incredible support, mostly outside of the South, including here in Colorado, and near unanimous support from black voters and other voters of color in the South. In Alabama, he got 98% of the black vote. He got 10% of the white vote. That was his poorest showing in America. And it was ironic that the argument, I'm using again charitably, that the argument Alabama made was we now have a black president. It was, not, it was through no um, effort at all of white voters in the state. But ultimately that, that ultimately, that argument was one of the arguments that led to the heart being torn out of the Federal Voting Rights Act. Just one more quick thing, Section 5. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg, in a, in a really powerful dissenting opinion, said that today's decision is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm mm. because you're not getting wet. <laughs> right? But of course, the reason you weren't getting wet was because you had the umbrella in the rainstorm. On the day that Section 5 fell, our dear brothers and sisters in Texas, yes, right, introduced a photo ID law that was previously blocked under Section 5. And we were fortunate to be a part of the lawsuit using a different provision of the Voting Rights Act. But I lifted up because that became the heart of the effort right away to scale back the progress we had seen in electing a black president and black elected officials. And I will say to you, that's why I love this moment, because when it happened, Mayor Reed will tell you, there was a deafening silence across the country. And that moment ushered in what we saw happen in voter suppression across the states. It led directly to the November 16 election, right? But consistent with our, our, our theme of contraction and expansion, the 2020 elections, even as we fought voter suppression in them, were the most historic in terms of turnout across this country. And as that expansion was happening in the electorate, we saw states continue to introduce at least 20 more voter suppression tactics. So what I think this lesson teaches us is that we've got to be super mindful of what's happening at the federal level, mm -hmm. but also about the opportunities we have at our local levels to do real work around building an inclusive democracy. It's kind of amazing that we're at the state right now where in order to de defend the Voting Rights Act, 
we have to prove racism doesn't exist in this country, right. or the, that racism exists in this right. country, uh, which is something that you'd think goes without saying. And to that, I mean, to that point, which I love, you know, the thing is that President Obama's election, like, I don't want to understate the significance. I think if I polled all of us in this room before he gets elected and I said to each of us, hey, can you imagine in your lifetimes that America would elect a black president, right? We would have said, at, maybe for my grandkids, but just given the way that the race is set up in this country, I don't think it's gonna happen. So I don't want to diminish the significance of electing a black president, but we also know that the election of the first black president doesn't mean that voters across the country don't still encounter significant efforts to scale back their voting, their voting rights. And that was a theme of, the, of democracy under the Voting Rights Act. Progress, for sure, always followed by efforts to scale back that progress. You, get, you actually cannot have, I think, consistent with history, you can't have a President Obama, right? You can't have President Obama and then not also have a Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. It's always been that way. One will always be followed by the other. And we're in that moment now. And I think that's a beautiful moment as, as much as it is a difficult one. So I, this is a good point to bring Representative Reynolds back in because you talk about the struggles at the federal level and as the federal protections seem to be eroding, uh, we focus on the states and yet it depends on what state you're living in. Uh, obviously, uh, Texas has been the epicenter <laughs> of a lot of legislation and litigation focused on redistricting. And uh, so, Representative Reynolds, I'd, I think we'd love to hear from you about your experience in fighting back uh, suppression efforts in Texas related to redistricting. Well, that's a good segue. Uh, and I'm glad that Senator West is here uh, from, from Texas as well. But you all may have saw um, during the first call special session, many of my colleagues and I fled the state of Texas to Washington, D.C. We didn't go there for a vacation or because we wanted to tour the Capitol. We went there because we were trying to get federal legislation passed because Texas was attempting to pass a very, very polarizing, very racially discriminatory that would have an adverse impact, uh, disparate impact among black and brown Texans. And so we, led, we left the state, broke warm, so that the, the state could not conduct its business. We knew we didn't have the numbers, so that was the only tool that we had. But we left so that we could appeal to the United States Congress to pass this federal voting rights legislation that has been damaged since the Shelby case. Mm -hmm. Now let me give you just a little briefly, just to tell you that since the Voting Rights Act was passed by a Texan, by the way, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Mm -hmm. But when it was reauthorized back in 2006, mm -hmm. it was another Texan, former President George Bush. It passed the United States Senate 98 mm -hmm. to zero. There was no opposition. There was only a few Congress people that voted no, but overwhelmingly it passed. No one thought of it as a partisan issue. Mm -hmm. So this should be a nonpartisan issue. But unfortunately, fast forward to the 2020 election of Trump and Biden, when Trump lost, he brought up the big lie of voter fraud. He, it was massive voter fraud. Now, every court, every court has debunked that. Even the most very conservative appointees that Trump named at the appellate level all the way up to the Supreme Court has debunked it because it was factually flawed. It was, it was false. It was a lie. But we, as a Texas and other states across this country, based on that big lie, have found a solution in search of a problem. Namely, we're going to combat voter fraud by passing these voter laws in Texas that would make it more difficult to vote. So here's what they're doing. You heard Mayor Turner talk about it earlier. We, we're in a pandemic. We implemented changes so that we, people could vote comfortably and people could vote safely. We implemented 24-hour voting, drive-through mm -hmm. voting, mobile voting. Guess what? All of that has been eliminated. Mm -hmm. It's all gone now. You can't do it. So, you know, we believe mayors should all have also believed in local control and the county commissioners should be able to have local control because you're closest to the people. The state of Texas has taken away local control so that mayors cannot implement uh, multiple, <coughs> multiple voting locations that people can turn in mail-in ballots. There's, there's Harris County can only have one drop-off location. We've made it more difficult for people to apply for a mail-in ballot. 
We've imp- that the worst part about it, one of the most troubling parts about it, is that we've empowered partisan poll watchers. Mm. So that if you imagine, mm. and I have to give you, you have to use your imagination. You've seen, uh, you may not be familiar with the Proud Boys, maybe you have, mm. but you've seen some of the insurrectionists that stormed the Capitol on January 6th, dressed in a certain way, uh, carrying themselves in a certain way. Well, they can be intimidating. Imagine being at a polling place in a black or brown community and you see a Anglo person dressed in a fatigue, Texas, we have open carry, they can intimidate you, right? I mean, that's real talk. That is voter suppression. So they go there and they say, well, what are you doing here? They may greet you in the parking lot. You may say, well, you know what? I'm gonna go somewhere else because I don't wanna get in trouble. Well, we've, we've allowed that to happen in Texas. And so without federal voting protection, states are able to do these things because guess what? There is no more preclearance. Mm-hmm. And I will say this lastly, ever since the enactment of the Voting Rights Act, every time we did redistricting, every mm-hmm. single time, mm-hmm. Texas has been found liable or guilty by a federal mm-hmm. court yeah. of intentionally discriminating against black and brown Texans. Yeah. Well, guess what? We don't have that protection now, but based on this last census, 95% mm-hmm of the population was because of African Americans, (coughs) Hispanic, and Asians, 95%. Yet 100% of the opportunity districts were Anglos, Mm -hmm. okay, 100%. There's no, and then the worst part about it, they tried to pair the only two African American congressional members that we have in Houston, Al Green and Sheila Jackson Lee, you may have Mm -hmm. seen on the news. They tried to draw them, Mm -hmm. not because their districts were too small, their districts were too big. They had to to share population. But to add insult to injury, they tried to pair them together until we took a stand and we fought and we fought and we fought and we were able to get an amendment to get that change. But But the point I'm making is this, we need federal protections Mm -hmm. to prevent states like Texas. Because Texas, I'm proud of my state, but Texas is a bad actor. We have a long history (laughs) of discrimination, and you know that. The voter ID law that he's talking about, that was my freshman term, it was implemented. It was implemented because largely of the success of Barack Obama with with students. Guess what, in Texas, you can use a concealed handgun license, Mm -hmm. so if you have a license to carry, you can use that to go vote, but if you're a student, at a state university with a valid state issued ID, you can't use that to go vote. Mm-hmm. Go figure. But you can use a concealed <laughs> handgun license. If you are a traveler and you have a passport, that qualifies. But those students at Texas Southern University and Prairie View, right. sorry, if you don't have a driver's license, guess what? You can't vote. So yes, we do need federal protections to prevent states like Texas. And I will tell you that we are terrible when it comes to voting, and we are the epicenter. And I'm, and I'm hopeful that the federal government, the United States Senate, because the House has already done their part. Mm-hmm. The House has already passed the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. They passed the For the People Act. The United States Senate, they need to pass federal legislation, and it should be bipartisan. And it's shameful that not one single Republican voted for the Freedom to Vote Act. Mm-hmm. And, and that's shameful. I don't, we can debate the filibuster's use or not, but that's shameful that when it passed in 2006, there was no Republican opposition. Now you can't find one Republican that's voted for the Freedom to Vote Act. So I'm troubled by it, but I'm gonna continue to work with you all to appeal to people's social consciousness so that they can be on the right side of history. I wanna make sure to give some kudos uh, to Ryan Haygood because he also worked on that that litigation fighting back against the Texas ID law. Uh, good, good for you. Can I, can I just make one point? Yeah. I mean, I love the representative's point about the changing demographics. When he was speaking about those, it made me think about back when, uh, when, when Mayor Hancock and I were in high school. Well, I was in high school. He was. Uh, <laughs> he, <laughs> but, but there was there there was this uh, pioneering rap group called uh, Public Enemy. Um, and if you don't know Public Enemy, you should pretend like you do. Yeah, right? you should. Right. And yeah. they had this CD. Uh, sorry, a record. Uh, sorry, that was entitled Fear of a Black Planet. And it had the earth, it had a, a black planet, right, that was beginning to eclipse the earth. And the whole CD, which is genius, talked about this phenomenon, America becoming a blacker, browner country, and the corresponding fear that would attach to those g- changing demographics. And that's the story of Texas. Yes. 
Right? That's the story of the Texas's photo ID law, to, that's right. to the representative's point. And that's really the story of the fear we see across the country. There's this sense that the changing demographics mean more people into a democracy, which mean, means more people who didn't traditionally have power now having power and influence. And the way you protect against that emerging power, if you're fearful of it, is you try to block it. That's right. The, and the reason I love that we're having this conversation in Denver, because I think Denver has done some, Colorado has done some amazing things in expanding democracy, is that there's another way to proceed. And that is, you look at what the changing demographics tell you, that the country is becoming browner, that by 2042 it will be the thing public enemy talked about, a majority mm -hmm. people of color country, and you say, wow, this is an opportunity to bring new voices, diverse voices, into our democracy. And that, I think, are the two choices that we, we contend with. And I think it's very important for states to stand with states like Texas and other states that are experiencing this voter suppression, those states that are championing expansion, to stand with those states that are experiencing real contraction. Well, I think uh, creating those important voting norms and holding them up as yeah. the standard yeah. and hopefully over time influencing other jurisdictions to follow suit is important. In Colorado, we have a bit of an experiment going on here where we have a nonpartisan uh, redistricting effort underway. I'd say the jury is still out mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. And certainly what we've seen is that politics has seeped its way. Mm -hmm. Partisan politics has seeped its way into the process notwithstanding all the efforts uh, of our charter amendments that voters approved. So um, what I do want to ask you both, though, is we've got a weakened voter, voter Voting Rights uh, Act. Uh, we've got troubles in certain states, um, and the politics of that uh, feel immovable at times. Uh, where do we go from here? There, there must be solutions out there that we as um, on, in the legal community or those uh, fighting the legal fights um, should be looking to and pursuing? Yeah. I'll say this. We have to channel our spirit of John Lewis and make good and necessary trouble. We have to be on the front lines. We have to speak truth to power. We have to use whatever means available, protest, uh, but the most fundamental thing is voting, voting your values, voting for people that support democracy and the freedom to vote. Uh, that is something that we have to do. We have to be engaged. We can't be on the sideline or we can't be of the opinion that, well, it's just politics. That is the critical foundation for this country is voting. Uh, and so we have to make sure that we're engaged and we have to make our voices loud. We have to really push back on, on the, to make sure the president gets m even more engaged because that, again, voting is the infrastructure of this country. So we have to impress upon uh, our, our elected representatives in the United States Senate and the United States Congress why they should pass this legislation and even why they may need to go as far as making an exception to the filibuster. If, if certain members aren't gonna be statesmen, they aren't gonna do the right thing, then we can't allow all the sacrifices that were made, all the people that literally died whose shoulders we stand on today to be in vain and allow these protections to be rolled back. So we have to do whatever is, yeah. is necessary to get federal legislation passed to President Biden's desk. And, I, and yeah. don't we have to push back on the narrative that this issue is not about race? Absolutely, we have to be real about it. It is about, it, it shouldn't be, but, it, but a lot of it is because he, Ryan pointed out, a lot of people are changing their perspective because of the growing demographics. We should allow people to vote no matter what their race is, no matter what their color, their, their party affiliation. It should be, hey, we're going to reach out to these new growing demographics to bring them in mm -hmm. to support us. We shouldn't try to prevent them from voting to win. Yeah. I want to make sure that we get a chance for questions. and so. Um, I think this is probably a good time to open it up. I know we've got a roving mic, so if any of you want to ask uh, the panel, Mr. Anthony, if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, I'm Richard Eidlin with a group called Business for America, and we've been uh, co-leading an, an coalition called Business for Voting Rights to support the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. There are about 230 companies involved, including Salesforce and Microsoft, Cummins, Best Buy, Patagonia, lots of companies. 
<clears throat> and we've been meeting over the past three months with Republican staff offices. So my question to you is when they, uh, their response to the, you know, to the encouragement that their boss vote for this bill, a num and a number of those senators, as you know, either voted for the legislation back in 2006, some of them have been there longer, like a Lindsey Graham or McConnell. They voted for it back in 96. <coughs> um, but what they're saying is, you know, number one, we don't need this because President Obama was elected mm -hmm. and the black turnout was higher in 16 and 20. Yeah. Number two, they talk about a federal takeover of state election administration responsibilities. Um, so what are some effective arguments, Ryan, maybe you, you know, you could particularly reflect on it with your work over the past eight years. What are the effective arguments um, to respond to those kinds of statements? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, one, I love, love the question. I mean, we were having a really fascinating conversation about um, before, before the, the lunch here about, you know, why vote? You know, so what is the value of the vote at all? And, and there were some really disheartening responses that some of the folks we're talking about had, which was the folks didn't feel connected to the vote, didn't feel like the vote mattered. Um, but I think part of our charge in this room is to really think about an affirmative vision for voting. Very often, I think we have conversations that are really defensive. You know, we're trying to stop harm. We're trying to stop a bad redistricting plan. We're trying to stop a voter suppression tactic, including photo ID measures. They're very defensive to stop harm. But what about if we thought about voting from an affirmative perspective? What about if we thought that voting is a tool that allows us to create the kind of country, the kind of society, the kind of communities that we want to live in, that really do think about the ways in which we are interconnected. What if the vote is a tool that unifies divided communities and country people, right? What about if we think about the vote as a way that brings us together around shared values? And if we think about it in that way, particularly given that the beautiful thing about this country is that it is becoming the most diverse it's ever been which means that by necessity, power will need to be shared. But those who hold on to power are not going to give it away freely. I think if there's a lesson to be learned about Selma, it is that if you want to have influence, you have to make people do it. President Johnson wasn't going to sign the Voting Rights Act on the strength of being a good guy. In fact, he said nine months earlier to John Lewis and Dr. King, I'm not going to, the country in 1964, he said, is suffering from civil rights fatigue. 1964, he said that mm -hmm. to those men. The country is struggling with civil rights fatigue. If you want a federal voting rights bill, you got to make me do it. And that was Bloody Sunday. That's right. That was them making him do it. And I think this for us, this is our Selma moment. That's We're right. going to win some people. Some people are winnable. I will say to you, use your time wisely, right? If there are folks who are giving you those arguments, those are disingenuous arguments, right? I think particularly for non-black, specifically white allies, what the Selma moment requires is for white allies to advocate for voting rights in ways that you believe your voting rights are tied to our own. Mm -hmm. So if we're on the bad side of a redistricting bill as black or brown people in Texas, we need white allies to align themselves right. with us as if they are too impacted by those bad bills because, because they yeah. are. But I do think it, I think it requires some real intentionality around whether the, the pushback you're getting is real, real or not, right? I think there are many, many more people of goodwill than bad. Well, I do believe that's true, but I think it's on us to organize those people. Okay. Next question. Yes. And we're going to do two questions and very short answers, and uh, we're going to be good. <laughs> I heard uh, short answers. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Alex Rias, National Urban League. Mm -hmm. um, I want to pose this question uh, just to sort of bring out some of the legal arguments that are happening in the current cases that are ongoing. Uh, if you could lay out some of those legal arguments, and part two of this question is if you could uh, speak to the importance of the non-governmental organizations, the nonprofits, mm -hmm. the corporations, um, and their, the necessity of having those kinds of organizations make a record mm -hmm. of the injustices that they see day to day. 
Yeah. Like, so really quickly, the, 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 the legal piece, I mean, so the representative mentioned it. This, this will be the first redistricting cycle with no Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Section 5 did some of its most robust work during redistricting, right? So the census shows the most racially diverse America we have is right now. It's getting more diverse as we move forward. Redistricting, as you all know, is about redrawing lines around where people live and who's represented. The legal community will absolutely be activated to litigate a host of cases in states like Texas, to be sure. And they'll marshal all manner of arguments, including that although we lost Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, and although the Supreme Court issued a ruling on another provision, Section 2, finding that it, Section 2 wasn't violated by some things that Arizona did, Section 2 is very much still in, in effect. And it, so if Section 5 is the shield, Section 5 is the sword. It allows you to strike out against racially discriminatory voting changes. And so I think we'll see Section 2 at play, particularly redistricting cycle, to, to be sure. But let me just say a quick word about the, commu the community, because the, the Attorney General for, for Denver, as she was identified, <laughs> and later for Colorado, as she was, I think, at prophesied. I think that the role of the community, I just want to return to this concretely. If we were to design a democracy that worked for us all, I think it would have a state-based voting rights act. So we talked about a federal voting rights act. States can create their own. I was talking to Rob Ritchie about this. Cal uh, mm -hmm. California did it, other states done it. Co Colorado could do it. Texas could aspire to do it. So a state-based voting rights act. Same-day voter registration, right? You go to the polls, you, you register. If you're not registered, you vote. Uh, online voter registration. So you can register online. You don't, have to, you don't have to fill out a form. Automatic voter registration. If you interact with an agency, you automatically get the right to vote. If you've been convicted of a crime, whether it's probation, parole, or you're in prison, like they do in Maine and Vermont, your vote should be restored. There should be no connection between the voting rights process and this broken, racialized criminal justice system, yeah. right? Yep. Doing away with prison-based gerrymandering. Why do we count people in prison as residents of their prison communities? That's not home. And in redistricting, all those resources, guess where they flow? <laughs> to those prison communities away from their home communities. Those are just a couple of things, yeah. I think, with an affirmative vision in our Selma moment, we could realize and we begin to advance them. Yes, sir, Ms. Hager, you have a question? Thank you. I'm John Yang with Asian Americans Advancing Justice mm -hmm. AAJC. <laughs> Love what you guys said. What will it take to change hearts and minds, especially of the white allies? I and mean, will it take another bloody Sunday? Will it take something like that that is so dramatic mm -hmm. to cause people to finally say, hey, we need to wake up, for the moderates yeah. to say, enough is enough? Yeah. I think that uh, certainly there's, there's no way to envision what it would take, but I think that it takes all of us doing our part. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there's a scripture that says, to whom much is given, much is required. All of us have to have that, if it is to be, is up to me attitude. We have to take that Selma moment and say, I wasn't there to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Many of us maybe have envisioned what we would have done if we lived on those times. Mm -hmm. Well, this is your Selma moment right so, now. Yeah. If we all take advantage of this opportunity to galvanize together as a country, regardless of race or party affiliation, and come together, that is the only way it's going to make a difference. So it's going to take that type of robust coming together we can't just do it as a partisan or a black or it can't be just a black and brown. It has to be all of us united mm -hmm. working together for the common cause of voting rights and democracy. Yeah. 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 Well, let's give that a hand. What a great way uh, to end. <laughs> um, and uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, Brother Haygood, if you weren't so big, I'd, I'd shut you off earlier. <laughs> I, saw, I saw you. You know, I, I was you. looking I at you, you too, but I said, I can't take you on you. You gave him. me that eye. I'll take on the rep, but I can't take you. <laughs> hey, can I just say, I did, I did bring a poster for folks. Uh, Mayor Hancock talked about the fierce urgency of now, and so I brought for folks a poster. I'll just put them out here. You can take it. But it says, to Dr. King's point, we're faced with the reality that tomorrow is today. We're confronted with the fierce urgency of now. And then it says it's our opportunity to choose community over chaos. And so it's historic. It comes from Alabama, the great state of Alabama. It sure is a take on to put some out here. And thanks again. Good job. Good job. Good work. Good work. Appreciate you. One of the other things I forgot to mention is on each of the tables, we have a white paper around the Voting Rights Act and a survey, state by state survey, of some of the suppression lawsuits that are pending. So feel free to take those. 
Thank you, Attorney General Brunson. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Uh, we, you know, it's funny, when the mayor and I and the group was planning for the conference, we knew that this was going to be probably the more, most impactful session because the laws, the legal system, and how it impacts access is essential. So um, if you guys will, uh, please talk at break and any other time with the panelists about what uh, they feel we can do as a state. I also want to give a shout out and thanks to Ignite Cities for uh, the lunch sponsorship. Uh, George Bersiaga is here. George, uh, stand up, because I've seen you on uh, Zooms for, for a year and a half. I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you. OK, so now it's time to go back to work, because after a lunch, what we didn't want you to do is sit here and listen to more panels or speeches. We want now to get you actively back into your groups. Uh, go into the same room, and the facilitators will, the new facilitators will come to you. Is that right, Jen? All right, the new facilitators will come to you uh, to um, frame up the next topic. So you got your colors on your uh, name badges. So let's get to work and um, we'll bring you back uh, right after uh, you get through with this session. Hey, thank you guys very much. Great lunch uh, panel.